And welcome back to the Genki Comics channel. I'm hey Gord. I'm Charles. And uh, yeah, today we got a special treat for you. Just leading up and getting excited for the zine party coming up here this weekend. So if all goes well, you should be watching this on Wednesday and getting excited to come visit us at the zine party on Saturday, November 12th. Uh, so Shelf Life Books has put on their first zine party in collaboration with the Community Wise Resource Center. Uh, there's going to be a few things there for you and the family to do if you bring the kids. There's some short films from Quick Draw Animation Library, the Long Lost Zine Library, which I hope to contribute to. I don't know. I'll nice. probably throw out some free copies of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a free, very fun photo booth, the historical tour of the Community Wise Building, which is the old Y, which apparently Charles got drunk in at one stage of his life. Yes, so, back in the late 90s. <laughs> back in the day when it was still the Y. So, in preparation for this show, you saw the last video of the um, Phantom Train of Medicine Hat, um, where we went through one of the zines that I made for the show, and it was, it was for the, the Halloween as well. And Charles has been hard at work getting some pieces together for the show as well. So we're going to take a look at a few of the things that he put together. Um, some pretty cool stuff. Some pretty personal stuff, I think. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you enjoy walking through this pile of, pile of goodness that Charles has laid out. Yeah, I kind of have been furiously at work for the last uh, week or two. Um, getting all this stuff. So this has all happened. All this stuff has been has been created in the last like Let's say 10 10 to 14 days. So it's been a bit of a, a whirlwind. My head is kind of spinning <laughs> to be honest um, So I guess we can just start start where we start. I'm gonna sweep some of this Because like sure. I've sure. got some material as well. So the first one's called ghost towns of uh, southern Alberta along the historic Red Coat Trail So I grew up uh, in southern Saskatchewan very close to the Red Coat Trail was always kind of a part of my life, um, and the uh, a lot of these ghost towns um, along that route in the Saskatchewan side were sort of my old stomping grounds. Um, so we did a so Gord and his family and myself and my spouse we did a nice little ghost town tour through southern Alberta back mm -hmm. in 2016. Quite some time ago now. It, it is. And when I saw these pictures that you drew for this, I was like, hey, I know these places. That's where we went. Yeah, so everything, this one for me was really fun because I worked from photographic reference for all of it. So these were photos I took in 2016 of us doing some of this um, this travel we did and going in and into some of these old buildings and seeing what we found there. Um, so quite honestly, the, the drawing part was a real joy because I was working from photo reference on this, uh, getting the old light box out uh, and doing work. The hardest thing for me was doing the, the there's quite a bit of, of wording in this, of lettering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had to actually typeset everything and then went back over oh. it and, re, and redrew in my yeah. own hand yeah. all of the text that's in here. Yeah. So for me, the drawing was the easy part. The writing was the stuff that's the stuff that cramped up the hand sure um because i had quite a bit to say <laughs> and uh um, because i tell some history of the expansion into western canada that the government did around the turn of the uh the 20th century so in the late 1800s and early 1900s there was this rapid expansion of people as as canada was trying to keep their foothold of the land, keep the Americans at bay who may have been thinking about some annexation mm. and also trying to, uh, you know, let's be honest, uh, continue colonization of the West uh, and the theft of traditional territories mm -hmm. of, uh, of First Nations and, and Indigenous peoples. And there's, there's some incredible stories along the Red Coat Trail that yeah. relate exactly to that, all kind of culminating at uh, Fort McLeod there. Mm -hmm. And there there was, I had a, I had much more, I have got scripts probably for a couple other ones I'd like to do as companion pieces to this. One will be of the creation of the Red Coat Trail, which actually, what it, does, what it did is it, it followed the 
more or less followed the route that the Northwest Mounted Police, which is now the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, took in what was called their March West. There was um, there was trouble still in a lot of lawlessness and whiskey trading in the mm. West that they felt contributed to one large event in, in particular that was a massacre, the Cypress Hills Massacre. And so they marched west from uh, Fort Dufferin, which is in Manitoba, to Fort Whoopup, which is now Lethbridge, mm -hmm. and then established Fort McLeod. And so that was a whole story I wanted to tell could not fit into this. That's a whole different story, a whole different zine. This one I wanted to tell just about the expansion of immigration uh, into this, this, and quite a bit of it was done almost as a bit of false advertising. Oh, it really they, was. They told people yeah. the land was, was free. They gave away the land for free. Wasn't always free because uh, the rail lines were selling it as well. Mm -hmm. They were told that the land was the most fertile in the world. You could all you need to do is turn the soil over and put a seed down and it will grow. Nothing else is needed. It's just the Never blue, mind those trees. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind trees or, or the boulders or the <laughs> and, you know the fact that it's mostly uh, grassland that is not made for food production. Let's be yeah. let's be real. Yeah. I grew up as a grain farmer my whole, you know, youth and uh, it was it is not a great place to grow crops. Yeah, it it yeah. has become like, you know, they do it. They do it and they do it well. Um, but yeah, they were kind of sold this false bill of goods. Um, For sure. And, Which uh, we're still riding on the coattail of, yeah. I, would, I would say, in Western Canada. But it, yeah, I think, I think and we, we talked about this a bit with uh, Phantom Train as well. It's mm -hmm. like when, we're, when you're adapting something or dipping your, your toes into history, how much do you include and how much space do you have to work with in context with that? So had you been working with, say, a 24-page comic, you probably could have included a ton of that stuff. But the I think the format dictates um, what you're going to include in here, as we're going to see with yes. some of your other yes. scenes as well. It, it became clear that I needed to edit myself down. Even then, it is quite wordy. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to tell this particular story, which is about talks about the colonial aspect and the immigration and the sort of who they were choosing to put to try to settle into Canada, who they were talking to, why they were doing it, and, and how they kind of bamboozled even some of the people who came over, oh, including, sure. including my, yeah. my <laughs> ancestors who came, came over and uh, had to clear the land, and you know, it, was, it was rough going. There's some weird stuff there. Yeah, that totally deserves some exploration. But I do want to mention a couple of, of these places in the spread here. You've got you've got the map going on. Mm -hmm. um, I love this. If you folks can't see it, future home of Kmart. When we were there, that sign looks like it was probably put up in like 1985. Yeah, it's been there for quite some time. <laughs> and so I, I captioned this one, Wishful Thinking, yeah. in, in uh, Nemescom. Nemescom, yeah. Yeah. And so, then Etzikum, i got to mention this place. This is yes. one of the best museums in Alberta. You folks got to go check it out. They really do have one of these giant windmills there that you can walk in. And it's a pretty charming little... And it's a fascinating story of how this, um, how this entire museum came about. And I'll, um, I'll tell you where you can read that story. There's a, I have a reference to it. Sure. There's a, um, uh, the Ghost Town Stories of the Red Coat Trail by Johnny Bukuski. Uh, is a great book. It focuses more on Saskatchewan towns, but the oh. stories it does have about the Alberta side are incredible as well. Nice. Some, the stories that come out, you have to remember, a lot of this stuff, it was late 1800s and into the early 1900s. So you go right into the, the roaring 20s, the depression of the 30s, the 40s and beyond. Mm -hmm. And there, so there are, of course, just amazing stories that come out of that. And, and Johnny Bukuski has a very casual... Um, storyteller way about him of, of explaining those things and it's a fun book sweet, sweet I grabbed it from the Calgary library and gave it a read it's a, it's a good do good one and easy visit to read. your library folks be literate it's so a good thing I wanted to have a, a map that that talked about this and showed it I put a couple of bonus ones as well when you talk about ghost towns in Alberta um, talking about the Minnewanka Landing, which is actually a sunken underwater town. Right. A that, major destination for scuba divers. It, yes. So yeah. it was a big destination for the affluent uh, Calgarians and Albertans back in its day. And then they uh, upgraded the dam for 
hydroelectric purposes yeah. and flooded the town and put it underwater. So now you can go and because the water is so clear, so cold, right. uh, it preserved the town. The wood stays preserved. Under That's there. incredible. So you can go That's down incredible. and see these buildings intact yeah. if you are a scuba diver, which I'm not, unfortunately. Yeah, but I you, don't know if I'm jumping in those yeah, mountain lakes. You, you can't. <laughs> well, when you're doing that, it's full gear and all. Right. But you can also do a really nice boat ride around Minnewanka Lake. And uh, the Frank Slide is the other For one sure. I want to talk about. I love that site. So those are outside the scope of this, but I couldn't talk about ghost towns in Alberta and not mention those two. Absolutely. But I have a great little map here of the ones yeah. that are along the, the Red Coat Trail. As soon as you go over in Saskatchewan, folks, you hit ones there as well and all the way over. It, if if you want to go further afield, because this, this for me, is something I want to give to people and inspire them to go on a road trip and yeah, check these things absolutely. out. But if you want to go to um, if you want to go all the way into Saskatchewan, uh, I would go all the way to Wood Mountain, and Wood Mountain is my old stomping grounds. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Wood Mountain is plays a huge part in the March West and in the Red Coat Trail. Not much left there now, but um, yeah, it's an amazing thing, and and I love it. I love absolutely I love checking these out. It was such a nice trip we did. Yeah, um, and exploring these places. You know, this abandoned schoolhouse in Nemescom is also really wild although i'd say take a respirator for that one we saw some stuff inside that i yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't feel yeah. good about breathing in <laughs> i'm pro i'm pretty fearless when it comes to that kind of stuff but legit folks like you should be suiting up to go into some of these places yeah um, yeah some gloves a mask and all yeah. of those things i think are are absolutely um essential for it yeah, and I I appreciate that that you've got some tips for some urban exploration or yeah, on the, or some on remote the exploration here. rules to follow. Like <laughs> don't don't basically don't mess with anything. Yeah, don't go break, in. Don't observe, break it. Don't take you know. don't take the artifacts out of the houses. Leave that stuff in there. It's um, because it, it's such a fun thing to go in and explore. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's one of those things where you, you take only photographs, leave only footprints yeah kind of yeah thing. and it's yeah. it's a lot of people's communities so you want to be respectful yeah. i'll quickly Sweet. show a couple of things yeah here. so i did this full designer style so <laughs> i did full mock-ups with typesetting yeah. that i then went back and i wrote in my hand and i had my photographic references That's and awesome. for my drawing and i threw this stuff on the light table and and went to town on it that's so, so cool man that's so, so that's, cool this is the way i I was able to kind of do what I would do in terms of, of um, graphic design and, and apply it to it. I do want to highlight a few pieces. Just the, the um, experimenting that you're doing with the stippling. With yeah. the bushes in the, yes. in the so house too, I noticed. It, it kind of was a fun really thing. Nice. I got to... Um, I really got to, you know, I had to, I had to use a lot of interpretation um, because this stuff is sure. very vague. It's very sure. dark. So I, um, but I, I was, remember that I was no. trying to figure out. Yeah. So I tried to figure out how to do it, how to imply depth and weight and scale. Sure. Um, so I got to play with stippling, which I've still been trying to get better and better at working with finer lines when I, t I tend to use a heavier hand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I got to have so much fun on this one. So good. Yeah. So good. So much really fun. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I did a couple of mock-ups. We're not, you know, Gordon's, when we looked at his mock-ups uh, last week, if you haven't checked that video out uh, of his yet, go back. You see, mine are very rough. I end up just making notes more than anything. Whereas Gord's was so, one thing I loved about your process of it, was your mock-up was really done like a storyboard. You had it really mm. sort of plotted out. Whereas I took so many notes, then I had to say, okay, I can't talk about this thing anymore. I can't talk about this. This is too big for the scope of it. And then I just went straight on designer and went, let me just lay this thing out. Yeah. In this style. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's weird. There's that method of writing comics that's... Um... I've always kind of referred to it as the Harvey Picar method, where mm -hmm. he's basically drawing, like, kind of like layouts almost when he's yeah. writing. You know, he, he, I don't know if he continued to do this up until his death, but was something that he did for a lot of it was drawing Stickman as his script. 
and handing that over to the artist. So mm -hmm. I, I tend to think in those ways when I'm when I'm drawing and when I'm putting something together. Uh, actually, I'm a pretty visual thinker. Obviously, as as artists, we're we're visual thinkers. But um, yeah, so so I think that's probably why mine looks the way it does. Mm -hmm. and yours is yeah, like you said, my designer design, brain takes design over. Design. Yeah, for especially for this one, when I saw the amount of um, information I wanted to impart about the history of of these places, I knew I had to go into designer mode on it. I wasn't adapting like yours a story with characters. Mine was yeah. places and history. Yeah, cool man. Yeah. So let's move into character. And some pretty, like, popular characters. Mm -hmm. Definitely popular characters and popular mythos that, you know, a lot of us grew up with and still live with, I think, largely. So, um, yeah, more adaptation. Yeah, so this, this moves full into adaptation, but from an established story. So, mm -hmm. once again, I'm kind of relying on... The, it's something that allowed me to get these done faster was going instead of trying to come up with a original story because I was kind of coming at this thing quite cold. Um, I said, why don't I adapt this? And a, a shout out to Kay Hogan from uh, Edmonton at the Edmonton Comic Expo uh, in 2022 here. I was really, really um, inspired by their little zines that the one that we showed in our Edmonton hall of the Hamlet told in nine in so eight cool. panels yeah. so I said boy could I do that with a popular film rather than a play and what what kind of challenges would that give me turns out a lot of challenges yeah uh, you have to cut a lot out you have to really be selective while still trying to get you're still trying to capture the sort of that feel the look and feel of something but you have to leave a lot on the cutting room floor yeah <laughs> we kind of talked about that earlier, but, um, but what, what, it's such yeah. a slim medium yes. and you know, you say zine and we know a zine is like a short piece, but really I think each one of these different formats that you have, like when you did the, the zine layout video, mm -hmm. it's like each one of those, you kind of have to learn that itself and like really think about how things are going to work in like, this is a different creature than that, mm -hmm. you know? Even though we're calling them zines, they're very different. Yeah, and I mean, I could have gone a totally different way with these and printed something that would be more tr a traditional thing with st a saddle stitched and uh, its own cover. I really wanted to keep the production super simple. I really wanted to, I wanted to start because I'm so kind of new to the whole comic creation scene. I wanted to basically start as simple as possible mm -hmm. and keep my production and my everything as simple as possible and focus on put a story into it and, and how, what does it take to put a story into it well one of the mechanisms in this one mm -hmm. that i really appreciate it as somebody who hasn't watched the movie all that much um but the uh the narrator yes like the narrator is such a good guide and you've got the narrator on each page which is so good for something this small and you're trying to adapt a two-hour movie. I don't know how long is it. It's, is it it's an hours? hour, hour and a half, hour, hour and a half. Minutes, yeah, like yeah. So, so yeah. so you've got a full movie, putting it into eight small pages. Yeah. You've got that extra piece of the narrator, which you've included on each mm -hmm. page, and not only does it move the story along, but it adds some some good humor. Yeah, I was short, able to actually put piece. some some jokes in and not have to do it as literal as they did so the narrator in the movie is your guide along with it but he doesn't make this sort of some of the uh things i have in here where he's making comments on what's happening mm. it doesn't always happen because it's the narrator in the story is telling you what happened as if it were in the past in a sort of academic sense where i have in this one him more uh also not knowing what's going to happen sure um that way i was able to to you know, like I have him here realize that Frankenfurter is a take on Frankenstein. Let's go, oh Frankenfurter, I I get it now, I understand. And him making comments on right. stuff in that way. So as a way for me to put some little jokes, but also tell people what they should be taking from this yeah. and what they should be understanding. Yeah. Um, I had to 
like I said, I had to leave a ton on the on the cutting room floor. I like full characters and side plots. There's Columbia's not in this. That's a yeah. major character. Doctor Scott is not in this. Eddie is not in this. Some of the favorite characters from it, unfortunately, I had to leave on the cutting room floor and focus purely on Brad and Janet, Frankenfurter. <laughs> you got Riff Raff and Magenta, and and Rocky. Yeah. So. With that, with that narrator piece, then is that something that you consciously thought about? Like, I'm gonna have him reacting as opposed to reporting. Yeah, sort of. As I went through it, um, this one came sort of. I jump around as I was creating these. I would sometimes say, "Oh, I know exactly what I want to do for this scene." So I would draw and figure this out, where I just have a rough understanding of what I wanted for the other panels. And then I'd go back and figure it out. So it, it kind of came about very organically and very quickly. Mm. Um, so as I, I started on this one, I really was trying, I was much more free form and I had him making these comments. Um, and that was kind of from the beginning is sure. I had, him, I think I started, I started with this one here, just the very first scene. And I wanted to have him as deadpan as possible to say, she says, Brad, oh, Janet. He says, I oh, just met Brad and Janet. Yeah. I just wanted to, yeah. I thought it would be funny just to have that and to, uh, that's a running thing in the film is them always exclaiming each, each other's names and it's everybody all the way through it. So you've got, oh, Brad, oh, Janet. You've got him screaming, oh, Rocky. She's screaming, oh, Rocky. He says, oh, Janet. It's, I was trying to play with the little tropes that go through the film. That, yeah. The things that stuck with me that I thought were very funny. Um, and you were yeah. disappointed that you couldn't include the yeah the mon or the singing montage. Couldn't, yeah, I couldn't. I I expected to have. I was going to have the narrator take an entire panel basically to show you what the time warp, how to do the time warp. But you figured out a way to put it in. Right? No, the time warp is not in here. Oh, okay. That's one of my my sad things. Um... The musical side of this one, unfortunately, I didn't have really a place. You know the. There are scenes from each one. You know, this is right before they do the time warp and then they meet Frank and Fritter. They, there are two musical numbers up in the lab. Um, you know, there, there, there's a whole musical number around Janet and Rocky hooking up. Mm. But I, couldn't, I didn't have... This yeah, one, I was trying, to keep, as, to, I was trying to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> yeah. So I always have the caveat of, please watch the film. I had to leave so much out. All right. There's a part that you sh I don't I can't remember where you put it, but like your your complete fold out to me is a flex, uh, a designer flex. <laughs> well, this it's, it's really impressive. This was this was the impetus for this entire thing. One, number one, I was I was inspired by Kay Hogan, yeah. and the simple telling of that. But my other thing was after I did that video of the simple zines in three ways, I was thinking about. Uh, not doing the simple eight page zine like this because I what I don't like is when it flips out you have a slit in the middle mm -hmm. but then I put my designer brain on and I said what would I do to turn that into something you could do you son um, of a bitch look at this. so <laughs> this this came before anything else is I I decided I wanted to make a poster that's interactive so we've got lyrics from science fiction double feature, the opening song to the okay, movie, okay. and you've got the lips that sing it. Holy hell! Um, that the way was to embrace the yeah, medium. That man. was that was the entire. This this is what kicked everything off. As I said, I could make an interactive poster and then feel okay with the fact that there's a a hole here. So I love it. Of all the, so I'm doing more of these. I have two of them done. I'm hoping to do more. And this idea of the interactive poster now is is a running thing in it. Damn you! So it's fun. So a mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and really, like you can sit and play with this, and you can, I don't know, if somebody was doing a midnight viewing or midnight screening of Rocky Horror, you could have the audience. <laughs> doing it along with it um yeah man so my mind goes to what else can we use this for what else <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of stuff you could do dirty comics with it you could do totally all sides. there's a lot it's definitely where my head went there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot you can do and i'm hoping to explore it in ways that are, it's not just mouths not just so i i also had another um i 
you know, the, the idea of using that as a mouth had come originally for another one I have not been able to complete that was also going to do a mouth. And then I said, for some from reason, I guess I was inspired by, by Kay's stuff. And then I thought, of, started thinking about Rocky Horror as one of my favorite shows. And then the mouth, because the mouth thing comes into it, like, yeah, I have to do this thing if I'm not going to get this other one done. Yeah. So, okay. So comic books talking about like compressed decompressed storytelling mm -hmm. you know you adapted this full length feature film into this little yeah eight page thing uh which you know watching a musical watching a comedy musical seems seems like a, a good challenge yeah and then i think <laughs> about you know bigger pieces of work that maybe have a lot more nuance to them <laughs> So we got Speedrunner. I so I got myself in. I guess <laughs> this is one of these things where it's one of those like uh, self-inflicted wounds, right? Sure. Where you, I started thinking about well, what are my favorite films, and what could I, what would I love to adapt, uh, and take the challenge of putting in eight pages. Mm -hmm. Blade Runner is the first one that came to mind because mm -hmm. once again, and maybe I'll skip right to the skip right to the poster of this sure one. yeah because i went immediately to roy batty doing his famous tears in the rain um speech now this one i have to cheat a little bit it's it's an entire hinge jaw it's a very like uh uh south park hinge jaw thing but hey, it works man i when i was playing with it before we started filming when i was playing with it and, and you've got you've got his his monologue yes, here you as were well. monologuing and Holy hell, like, I was looking this dude in the eyes as I'm reading. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> seen things you people wouldn't believe. And totally, I was looking at this dude in the eye as I'm doing it. Yeah. So good, so good. And maybe that's because the size that it's in, like, it's... it's yeah. it's almost life-size. Yeah. yeah. And... And that was done very, you know, because I, I, I know what I have for the slit and I know what I need to do there. So I wanted to have it big and impactful. And uh, this, yeah, doing this stuff makes me appreciate these films more because I, I actually mm. notice more nuance as I'm going through because I'm having to deconstruct it in my own mind and watch clips of it, of these things over and over and over to figure out how the heck I'm going to adapt it. Um, I came out of it with a better understanding of the movie Blade Runner than I've ever had. And I've watched every version that's out yeah. there. My, my personal favorite is the final cut that's uh, very, very known out there. Um, but I feel like I understand the film better now than I ever have. <laughs> Paid attention to things Man. better. Well, both of these, I think, are kind of kind of like this. But I don't know. When, when stuff like this... When people do stuff like this, it really makes me appreciate the source material all, mm -hmm. all the more, Absolutely. right? Like, we were kind of, we were talking a bit about it on, on the way here. Um, you know, do androids dream of electric sheep? Blade Runner being a thin piece of that. And then here we are with Speed Runner being a thin piece of, yeah. of Blade Runner. And, and impressively so, like what wonderful source material that it just keeps giving like mm -hmm. this right and, and really inspires creativity like you know yeah. we, talk, we talked about Handmaid's Tale in another video and same kind of thing there right like just such a genius piece of literature that just keeps on giving and we as creatives can keep playing with those mythos yeah and, like wow. what, what a well to draw from um you know i i i don't feel i barely even scratched the surface i had to go super deep in this one lots of lots of actual panels on yeah. it but even then i was still leaving lots on the cutting room floor and then trying to figure out what what would it what can you take out but still same as the rocky horror stuff what how much can you take away before you remove the sort of soul of, of something mm -hmm. so what do i need to have that actually shows emotion that shows the power and the strength of this this story and also the uh, like the anguish of a lot of you know the, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's a story it's a, it's, it's a story of, of loneliness and yeah. anguish and pain and um the futility of of life sometimes and also the preciousness of life so you got to get that into eight, eight pages. Yeah, there. and how do you do that? And did I do it? I hope I did. I I feel like I, you know, taking some some very specific scenes, 
of, of people, people speaking to them, to each other. And, you know, Roy Batty's quest for more life from his creator. Um, and then finding, finding his creator want, you know, in, you know, inadequate. Um, and then doing the ultimate, you know, rebellion against your own creator. Um, yeah, wow. was part, part of ways to do it. So once again, leaving swaths of story out, but sure. trying to keep the essence of everything in there. Um, yeah. yeah. So there, there was, uh, like this page, mm -hmm. you know, really relying on comic book language to, to do this. So comparatively to like Rocky Horror Quickie Show, um, you've got five panels in this tiny, tiny page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. And, and it's an action scene, no less. <laughs> and I only had to do something similar once in Rocky Horror Picture Show because I kept it to just single compositions right. until I got to the, the their night in the right. in the castle. Their night of s steamy, scintillating uh, times was the only time I had to do that. Where this one, I have to, I've had to tell things in, in multiple panels more often, whereas I, I found times to just focus on a single composition, um, but there was still a lot going on around it. There's, it's, a, it's a big story, folks. The more I think about it, the more intimidating it gets. Because like, you know, like I, I've written other stuff and like wrote, wrote the novel, wrote a couple of novels. And, and I love poetry so much, but I it's so intimidating to me because the real estate is very limited and you have to be so precise with what you're doing. Um, I, th I feel like this is kind of like that. You know, if, if we had a 24 page standard comic, you can include so much, but geez like those emotions that you're talking about and the nuance of those emotions it's like how do we how do we capture that in such a tight and how, tight you, how do you do it in eight pages yeah like it's every centimeter here is valuable space yeah. yeah yeah because i i think there was a comic adaptation of blade runner for sure um and it's one of those things where adapt, that's already a challenge when you have um much larger real estate of, of what you tell and how you tell it but then also be looking at condensing it and doing it. I, I've got such appreciation for anybody who does zines <laughs> and who does any sort of comic creation just because you have you have to have so many considerations um, and this was a lot of self like I said a lot of self-inflicted uh, challenge on this one mm -hmm. but it was so eye-opening to me of, of the, the challenges that I would have to face to do it and I feel more, um, more prepared now to take on more of what we're doing in Genki Comics as a whole from this exercise. Mm -hmm. I, I'm able to see now and sort of break through some of my own mental barriers of like, okay, when do I have to chop something out, throw it on the floor, and, and be okay with that? Mm -hmm. And versus what are the most important things to put forward and communicate to people and how you have to communicate it. So I think this has been a super... Um, productive for me a couple weeks not only in this output but also in my own uh growth and understanding so it's been it's been very so good. great so great to to witness and be a part of and discovering it and your pacing too oh my god yeah very rewarding and uh i hope you you fo i have a couple challenges to you folks who are watching um one is to come to our come to this zine show yes, on please. Saturday. Come to oh I threw it in the recycling. That's the last <laughs> time we're gonna use it. Uh, come to the zine show for sure. That's that's one challenge to you. But another challenge I would like to see is like more of this kind of thing. Like when I go to the zine shows and picking up something like this, trading card size, um, and a quick adaptation of like your favorite movie. I want to know what people yeah. say about those movies for sure. And there's probably some wicked weird stuff out there. Absolutely, because we we all see these things very different in our perception. So uh, some people would have taken these very different directions than I did. Um, and 
even just telling just a simple story, say a, a, a joke you shared with friends or something like that. It's amazing this, this stuff and, and how quickly your mind can move from one topic to the next on these and come up with little little tidbits of, of story that you can tell. And you don't need a huge, you know, you do not have to take on something as huge as this. You could take on something as simple as an afternoon you had out like with ghost towns where I took a, uh, what, a two or three day trip we, we had yeah, over a long yeah. weekend. And, uh, and turn it into something. Yeah. Come pick this up. You got a road map. You got no excuses. Get down there to Southern Alberta. <laughs> yeah, and, and don't don't uh, don't sleep on gourds either. That Phantom Train of Mess and Hat is a real banger. It's a great zine. So, yeah, come check us out. Yeah, and, and, absolutely. Uh, Looking forward to seeing you folks there. Uh, and, yeah, look forward to my uh, class of Newcomb High and zine at some point. Hey. Cool. <laughs> we got a mind promo. All right, folks, uh, like, follow, subscribe, bullet, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, folks.